George, come on up. Great to have you here. Good to be here. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mel. Appreciate it. It's good to be back here to talk with you again. Uh, thank you for coming out on such a beautiful summer evening, which we're going to have less and less of. So I appreciate you taking the time uh, to come out. And don't, don't complain about the heat, because it'll be snowing before you know it. So, <laughs> um, yeah, there's so much to talk about. But I think the basic idea is this. Um, if you had told me just a few years ago that we'd be standing here and saying to ourselves that our government has gone from being a representative republic to being a dictatorship yeah. Yeah. Right. that has gone from a government of the people, by the people, and for the people to the government of special interests, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the government of big tech, mm -hmm. to the government of a, quite frankly, brain-dead meat puppet <laughs> that is in the White House yeah. right now. Yeah. Uh, and I wish I was exaggerating. Um, <clears throat> it's frightening. What we're seeing now is we're seeing, you know, we saw the raid on Mar-a-Lago. This is something that happens in banana republics. This is not something that happens in the United States of America. And Mel, you brought up a good thing in your prayer. You said you wish that our representatives would step, stand up, and speak out. There's not enough to do. Because of a number of reasons. Because there's a lot of self-serving politicians that just are seeing what's next for them. And they want to make sure that they don't go against the grain or buck the system because they might not get invited to the cocktail parties and be a part of the in crowd anymore. And that's unfortunately why, how we got where we are. We got where we are not because the Democrats did a good job. We got where we are because the Republicans didn't speak up. Because they were just Democrat light. Yeah. And this is something that I said a long time ago, and, it's, and to me, it's important now more than ever. I am not going to defend myself in their twisted version of reality. Okay, I'm not going to sit here and say, everything is racist. America is a racist country based on racism. And then we're supposed to defend ourselves in their version of reality. That's the problem. I reject your version of reality. This is a nation founded in freedom. And people came here to escape tyranny, to escape over taxation, to be able to, to, be able to praise God freely and willingly yeah. and not be canceled mm -hmm. and not be told that uh, what you believe is wrong. Not enough of our elected officials will say this is the greatest nation that has ever existed. It's the greatest nation on earth. And that's why we stand to lose it. Because not enough people are willing to stand up and say it. Mm -hmm. Here in New York State, we suffer more than any other state because we have a government that believes that they have to win this ridiculous contest to prove that we're the most progressive. Yeah. Most progressive, yeah. aka the most crazy. <laughs> That's why we have so many of the things that we have right now. You know, the, the, the fact that we are still living under a state of emergency right now. Look around, look outside. It's okay to go to baseball games, it's okay to go to Walmart, it's okay to, you know, Go anywhere you want, but don't go vote in person because that's dangerous. It's dangerous to their power. It's dangerous to them keeping their grip on us. But they want you to be also dangerous for your health to go vote in person. And that's the path that we're on in New York State. So we have to speak up. We cannot uh, say, well, you know what, it's just, we're going to try, but in the end, we're not going to really achieve. We have to push back more. That's why. When we saw these ridiculous isolation and quarantine rules that were really pulled from an assembly bill, A416, that never went anywhere. Nick Perry's bill has been around since 2015, before the pandemic. And it basically said that the government has the right to pull you out of your homes if they suspect that you have been exposed to a contagious disease. Don't have to prove it. No due process, no ability to appeal. We're just going to take you from your home. That bill never had a single co-sponsor. It never made it onto a committee agenda. It never had any companion legislation in the Senate. It was an orphan. But Kathy Hochul thought it would be a great idea to cut and paste that bill and put it into Department of Health regulations. And she actually made it worse because she took away the ability for people to actually have a fair trial. 
And for the government to have the burden of proving that A, you actually have a disease, or you have been really exposed to the disease, and B, that you're actually a danger to society and to, and to others. And she said, no, no. And the worst part about it is people think that they want to make it all about COVID. It's all about COVID, COVID, COVID. This, there is a long list of diseases that you could potentially be exposed to that would give the government the right to pull you out of your home, your children, pull you out of your home, take you somewhere else. When will I get to see my son again? We'll let you know. Where are you taking him? We'll let you know. This is stuff you see in China. And that's what Kathy Hochul did. And that is why I sued her. Yay. Yay. <laughs> and about a month ago, we won. <laughs> so that's the good news. The bad news is, is that she's appealing that decision. Now, this was not, you know, a lot of times in these decisions, uh, it's a technicality. You know, you didn't do this right, you didn't cross that T, you didn't dot that I, but this decision by the state Supreme Court judge from Cattaraugus County was 14 pages long. And very detailed as to why this is illegal, unconstitutional, a violation of due process, violation of separation of powers, very thorough. And a lot of what he said, thank goodness, came from the amicus brief that our good friend Andy Goodell wrote. And he literally quoted chapter and verse that amicus brief. So Andy Goodell did an amazing job. Was the you know, If there was anybody that really brought it home for us as far as the decision, it was Andy. And of course, uh, Will Barclay, who was the uh, leader in the assembly, who also was part of the amicus brief, as well as, as some of Joe Giglio from Cattaraugus County. So it was really a team effort. Um, and it, were any of you at the uh, Freedom Lovers picnic over in Cattaraugus County in Franklinville? Anybody? Yeah. Uh, what a great event that was. And Bobby Ann Cox. Uh, I'm also going to say that Kathy Hogle was the attorney from Westchester West. County. She's the one who took this on. She's the one that actually, for nothing, you know, for pro bono, mm -hmm. brought this lawsuit. She's about this tall. Mm -hmm. She's about that wide. <laughs> and she is a pistol. Yes. She's an amazing woman. But what this regulation said, which, which Senator Borrello touched on, is they could pick and choose which New Yorkers they were going to lock up or lock down so they could force you to stay in your home. They could remove you from your home and put you into a facility that they chose. And she believes that our freedoms are under attack. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the loss of liberty doesn't happen in a flood, in a wave, because they know that, that they can't do it. They happens by a trickle, one little trickle at a time. So look at where we are now, and look at where we were two years ago. Mm -hmm. And what they learned in the pandemic, those that wish to keep us under their thumb, is they learned how much they could actually get away with. If they just spread a little bit of fear, a little bit of misinformation, and to tell you, well, if you don't do that, you're not a patriot. You, you, know, you, 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 you are not looking out for your, uh, for your fellow man. Because you're not going to put that rag on your face. <laughs> That's what they learned. They learned how much they could get away with. And we let them. We let them. When Anthony Fauci said, you know what, really wearing a mask, this isn't going to do anything. And all of a sudden, like two days later, oh, wait, we all have to wear masks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look at folks. It was a pandemic. People died. It was a serious thing. We should all have taken that seriously. But where we went was from a public health crisis to a constitutional crisis. Mm -hmm. And we let that happen. Mm -hmm. So here in New York State, we live under the thumb of one party rule. Now, I come from a family of lifelong Democrats. I have been a Republican since day one when I registered. I grew up as a Reagan Republican. Uh, but my family, they're not the Democrats that you see now. They are, this, the, you know, they, they are old school working class Democrats. This is no longer the party of the working class. It's the party of socialism. It's the party of, you know, of oppression that no longer free thought you know, you're allowed to speak as long as you agree with us. This is not the party that my father, my grandfather, and so many others created. This is the party now that is looking to take down this republic. Because they want what so many other people around the world want. And they want to see the United States of America taken down a few notches. 
Well, how do you do that? How do you take the greatest, most powerful nation on, world, on earth, a superpower, and how do you bring it down a few notches? Well, you make sure that we can't be energy independent, and we can no longer feed ourselves. And then you guilt everybody into saying that, well, if you don't believe that America should get off the fossil fuels, then you're just not uh, a patriot. You wanna, we're gonna, Earth is going to come to an end in a few years if we don't do this. What about the rest of the world? What about China that's building, on average, one new coal-fired power plant a day? They get a pass. Not the United States of America that actually has been a leader in clean energy for a long time. No. No, Russia, India, China. Once again, we saw, what were we here today? Gas prices are going to go up because the Saudis, that whole cartel, is going to start pulling back on production. We are living with our president going on bended knee to terrorists and dictators and saying, please help us, instead of doing it ourselves. Agriculture. I'm the ranking member of the Senate Agriculture Committee. I'm very proud. New York agriculture is a critical part of our economy. It's the number one industry in New York State. What are we doing to our agriculture industry? Well, we're saying that we're going to continue to press down on the regulations. We're going to make it harder for you to do business. In the meantime, we're going to dangle these little renewable energy projects in front of you. Here's, a, here's some wind turbines and solar panels. You don't have to grow corn anymore. You don't have to raise animals or milk cows. You can grow solar panels now. We'll pay you more. And we're losing thousands and thousands of acres a day, farmland a day to these ridiculous boondog renewable energy projects. That's how you take down a country. Make sure it can't feed itself. Make sure it can't defend itself. Make sure it doesn't have the power, literally the power, the energy that it needs to survive. And it's all under the auspices of we have to become cleaner and greener and nicer to the rest of the world. We're going to unilaterally disarm our entire economy to prove somehow that we are leading by example. That never works. That never works. When does unilateral disarmament ever work? Throughout history. We're just going to throw down our arms and we'll make sure that we're leading by example. That's what's happening in our nation. And our state is leading that charge, unfortunately. I think there's good news, though. The good news is people are finally figuring this out. You tore down 30 plus years of low inflation in 18 months. You destroyed the strongest economy in the world in 18 months. You took the freest nation on earth and turned it into a banana republic where people are systemically taken from their homes. That our government has politicized the FBI, everything else, for their own political needs. All that happened in the last 18 months. Think about that. That's astonishing. But people are fed up. I hear from people every day. My father, lifelong Democrat, I didn't sign up for this stuff. We're going to have abortions until the moment of birth. We're going to let socialists tell you how capitalism should work. That's been a great idea, huh? <laughs> We're going to continue to walk backwards and retreat instead of saying enough is enough. But it is enough. People are fed up. Everyday people are saying, We're not, we didn't sign up for this. We can't survive like this. I don't want to live in a country where I have to worry about whether or not the power is going to be on the next day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. I don't want to live in a country where I'm not sure if food's going to be in the store. And I certainly don't think we need to. That's not us. That's not the United States of America. And New York State, we were the great state. This is the state everybody wanted to do business in. This was the, the financial capital of the world. That's all falling apart, too. The NASDAQ exchange is considering moving to Texas. <laughs> when Wall Street doesn't have to be on Wall Street anymore because of technology, they don't have to be here anymore. And that's what so many of my colleagues don't understand. The arrogance of saying, well, you have to be in New York. You have to do business here. No, you don't. So people are starting to understand that, and they are starting to push back. And I think we have a tremendous opportunity in this upcoming election. It's probably the most important election in my lifetime. And people say that all the time, this is an important election. Seriously, folks, think about what's going on right now. Think about what we're facing. How many more months, years, 
can we, can we continue this downward spiral without there being a real problem that we can't recover from? So that's what we're fighting against. We're fighting against it in the New York State Senate. We're fighting against it every day. We're standing up, saying enough is enough. We need more people to do that as well. You know, hopefully I would think everybody went and voted today, right? Yeah. It's great to be in a room with people that actually voted today. <laughs> That's going to be, what, you know what the turnout's going to be today in the Republican primary? 11, 12%, 15%. <laughs> now think about that. You know, there's a special election today to decide who will be in Congress. Now think for the moment that when the Democrats lose the House of Representatives, they're going to have a few months to do as much crazy crap as they can, right? And we have a special election to determine who's going to be sitting in the 23rd Congressional District and helping to push back. And every vote counts. And only 15% of Republicans are probably going to turn out and vote. Registered Republicans. So people still don't get it. But we, got it, we, we, will get, we will continue to get the message out there. We will continue to push. You know, we, we were successful in this lawsuit. Uh, we have been successful in other areas getting the message out there, pushing back against all these things that are so harmful here in New York State. But really, it's, it can't be just a handful of us. It has to be everybody. Everybody has to understand that. We have to say enough is enough. I am not going to defend myself in your version of reality. We're going to get back to saying that this is, the, this is the land of the free and the home of the brave. This is, thank God, so many people have spilled their blood for this country. And we're going to let that all fall apart for the fact that we feel a little uncomfortable talking about some of these things, right? We're a little uncomfortable talking about some of these topics because they make us, they want us to be uncomfortable. Well, we're going to have to be uncomfortable. We're going to have to speak up. We're going to have to speak out. This election coming up, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to elect Lee Zeldin as our next governor. Uh, I know Lee well. He's a good man. I'm proud to be one of his campaign co-chairs, the only one here in Western New York, as a matter of fact. And he can win this election. There, the numbers are there. And, and again, enough people are, are motivated, but they've got to show up on election day. Right. Yeah, we, have to flip, we've, we have to flip the New York State Senate back to Republicans. We need, at very least, divided government here in New York. Because one party rule has just been bad ideas like shit through a goose. It's frustrating a little bit because we know what's at stake. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there's just so many people out there. We, we've watched now. Look at, our kids have really lost hope. Okay, they've lost hope. We've told them that it's okay to sit home. You know, now we've even, we've even said the American dream is now a horrible thing to say. They'll no longer say the American dream. That was the American dream. You know, I, I, my wife and I are in the restaurant business. Anybody who's been to Sunset Bay? I know you guys know where that is. Uh, so, you know, yeah, I, 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 sorry about that. It's economic, of course, yeah, exactly. But I started there when I was in college, working in the parking lot, eating dust out in the hot summer days, all summer long. And what I wanted back then is, I wanted to be the guy that owned the place. And now I am the guy that owned the place. Ains owns the place. That's the American dream. You know what the kids think now? I can't believe I have to sit out here in the parking lot eating dust and yeah. getting paid minimum wage. How come I'm not CEO? I've been here for four days. <laughs> uh, and we've taught our kids that that's that sense of entitlement, right? Okay. What do we do? We let, we let them quit their jobs, collect unemployment, sit at home, get extra money, get stoned, play video games, and hope that something better comes along. That's what we've done to our children. They've lost hope. It's not just me saying that. If you look at the statistics, you look at the studies, they're more depressed than ever. They're more addicted to things than ever. They're certainly addicted to the social media, their phones, everything else. They, they were, this, this narcissistic view of the world. A nihilistic. Yes, that's true. Very nihilistic. Very nihilistic. Yeah. And, and quite frankly, this is another part of how do you destroy a nation. You ensure that the next generation isn't going to live as good of a, of a life. We all want, I mean, our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, they all want us to live a better life than they lived. And we've done that for how many generations now? A couple hundred years. And we're creating another generation that isn't going to be because of another country, isn't going to be because of a war, or it's because we have actually internally allowed this to happen. Allowed our children to lose hope. 
to turn against each other. You know, you are the oppressor, and they are the oppressed. That's what it used to be. You know, we're all equal, right? We're all, we all are given the same opportunities, and we all use those opportunities, and, and this, this great nation gives you the education, it gives you the opportunities, it gives you the resources. Now it's about the oppressor and the oppressed. It's Marxism. Mm-hmm. And they just were able to wrap it up in good thing, in interesting things that, that make people feel guilty. That's it. But it's still the same basic premise. Oppressor versus the oppressed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not democracy, not equality, but how do we keep people separated and angry at each other? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, what we, that's how you, again, this is how you tear apart a nation. The tribalism. Mm-hmm. You, you hear it so much. Well, I want to make sure that this person looks like me, or I don't want to go to that place. I don't want to do business there. I don't want to live there. How horrible is that? You hear that. Is that not racism? Mm -hmm. Are we not all Americans? Do we not all bleed the same color? Mm -hmm. Politics used to stop at the water's edge, no longer. Yes, critical race theory. Yeah, all those, yes. Exactly. Yes. Racism. Yes, it's yes. Stab in the back. But that's not a real thing, CRT, Mike. That's not a real thing. Yeah, I, I had an argument with that at another town hall where a teacher said, no, no, that's not it. That stack of books I yeah, have. It's, <laughs> yes, it's not real. So, but I, I, I don't want to go on all night, and I, but I do want to say a couple things kind of in closing, and that's, I do have hope. You know, I was at the farmer neighbor dinner tonight at uh, at the Ellen- in Ellington at the uh, the Grand View. Has anybody ever been to the Grand View in Ellington? It's a beautiful place. And you know, you look out there, you look at the lakes, you look at all the beautiful places, the people, all our friends, our neighbors. This is worth fighting for. Mm-hmm. This is why I do this job and so many of my colleagues because this is worth saving. Mm-hmm. I don't want to leave. They can leave. Yeah. Yeah. This is our state. <laughs> So with that, I'm sure I forgot a lot of things that I was supposed to talk about, Mel, but... Uh, but people got a few questions. Yes, today. sure. Let's, yeah, we have some time for some questions. Yes. I have two. Sure. Oh, damn it. One is <laughs> appeal. Yes, the appeal. Okay, so what happened with that? Well, so, look, at the, the game always is, you know, whoever has the most money can fight the hardest. Uh, but look at... I have a lot of hope. First of all... Um, is a 14-page decision, very detailed, as I mentioned before. Secondly, they did not apply um, for a uh, for a stay. Essentially, this our, that decision made by the uh, the state supreme court court judge uh, struck down everything. Those regulations are no longer in, they're no longer part of regulation. No longer I don't want to call it law, but you know they're no longer enforceable. They could have applied for a stay. Which would mean, that, you know, until we get an appeal, we want that to be in place. And they did not do that. That's a good sign. Um, secondly, if you look at the redistricting that we went through, um, kind of the same arrogance that, well, we're Democrats and liberals and all those judges, they're all liberals and we appointed them and we're going to win eventually. Well, that didn't work out so well for them, did it? It went from the state Supreme Court to the appellate division to the Court of Appeals, the highest court in New York State. And they said, are you guys kidding? You, you really, I mean, they, every single member of the Court of Appeals was appointed by either Andrew Cuomo or Kathy Hochul. And seven of the, uh, excuse me, uh, five of the seven said, this is wrong. Now think about that. Uh, so, yes, so I'm glad, I'm glad that they actually looked at the law and not at the politics. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm confident that's going to happen here, but we're going to have to go through the process. And if they lose at the appellate division, they'll probably appeal it to the Court of Appeals. We've called on the governor very publicly, don't do this. Okay, the will of the people is, we don't want this. The will of the legislature, that's just really what this, the basis of our lawsuit was, this was a violation of the separation of powers. Yep. Because yep. A416 never went anywhere, that means that the legislature has no intention to bring out something like this, a regulation like this. Okay, there, it clearly shows that there is no intent on the part of the legislature to create this type of, of law. Therefore, what you've done is a violation of the separation of powers. You're trying to basically create laws, which is not the role of the executive branch. That was the basis of our lawsuit. So that being said, that's still the fundamental reason that this uh, was struck down. On top of everything else, the, gov- the, 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 the court said thank to, thanks to Andy Goodell. Um, so as we go up the chain, we're just going to continue to fight. 
and thank God for Bobby Ann and, and, and everyone else that's, that, that's uh, stood up and said enough's enough. So, we sh sh do you have another question? Sorry, no, one, one second. <laughs> it's about the gun, gun laws. Changes yeah. Did that happen without the legislature? No, the legislature did that, uh, and the governor signed it. But you know, it was a very hastily put together. All of these gun laws, the last, the ones they did the last week of session, and then the special session they called, all unconstitutional, all poorly drafted. Uh, and there's already at least three lawsuits right now uh, to, to bring them down. Four, four, thank you. Uh, yes, so, so, yeah, so we're going to keep fighting there too. So, uh, Do you feel that uh, there is adequate um, uh, protection of, the, of uh, the voting in New York State? I mean, like, there's devices like uh, uh, ballot harvesting. And yeah. Like didn't uh, go against the uh, integrity of the vote. Yeah. Does that exist in New York? Yeah, so New York State, uh, over the last, you know, once the, the Democrats took over the, the Senate and already had the Assembly, and the, they have basically legalized uh, things that, that really uh, challenge the integrity of our elections, period. It, it was already legal to ballot harvest in New York State, which m many states, it's, it's illegal. Um, but they've also made it much, much easier for people to commit um, election fraud. Now, they want to tell you that election fraud doesn't exist. Uh, but it does. And, but the most important thing is people need to have confidence that our elections are secure. It's not, they, they say the most important thing is that everybody votes. No. This is a free country. You still have the right not to vote if you don't want to. Okay? The most important thing is not making sure everybody votes. The most important thing is that the vote is secure. Yeah. And that yep. people have, yep. el they have the belief that our elections are honest. Mm -hmm. That's the most, that's the, the, if there's anything mm -hmm. that could tear apart our democracy, mm -hmm. it's the fact when people lose faith that their elections are honest. Mm -hmm. Did you see the uh, uh, movie, uh, 2000 Mules? I haven't seen it, but I've heard, uh, yeah, I've, I've heard it's a great movie, yes, and yes. Well, and look, we just had a, a case, two cases in New York State that where they, uh, you know, one of the things that we fought against I, I, that, I, um, uh, that I debated was this idea that you could go online and request an absentee ballot and no signature is required. Mm -hmm. and then the ballot shows up at your door and you know, they say, well, you get a signature on the ballot once they get it. But what are you comparing it to? Well, it used to be in New York State that in order to get an absentee ballot, you had to sign a form. And then they have your signature. And on the floor of the Senate, I said, wait a second. I said, what if somebody decides to just go onto the portal, you know, the website, and just start sending people absentee ballots? Oh, that's never going to happen. Sure as hell did. They just caught two guys, each one of them requested over 100 ballots each, one Republican, one Democrat. This is not one side or the other. This is, you know, this election fraud has no, no party affiliation. I can guarantee you that. And those are just the two guys that got caught. Okay? And I said, well, wait, what if I'm an employer and I go to my people and say, guess what, folks? I like so-and-so. I want him to be our next congressman, governor, whatever. And I just went on and sent all of you folks absentee ballots, and I expect you to vote that way. That could happen, right? Yeah. But my, well, you know, election fraud is a 1.001, no. Think about our elections here. Think about how many of our elections turn on a handful of votes, right? When I first became a county legislator, I ran in 2009. We flipped the Chautauqua County Legislature from Democrat to Republican by one race, one, one county legislator that was elected by th a vote of three margin, a margin of three votes. Wow. And that had to be lit litigated to get to, now think about that, the entire composition of the county legislature hung on three votes. So when you tell me somebody illegally ballot harvested 100 ballots, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, even in New York City, we had a case in 2014, a guy, um, Hector Ramirez. Hector Ramirez was a member of the assembly, or he wanted to be a member of the assembly. And um, he and his uh, uh, like campaign manager went out and just fraudulently collected absentee ballots. Now this is now it's e even easier now, thanks to the new laws, to do that to ballot harvest because you, again you can request them. You don't you have, to have signatures, all that stuff. So when he they originally counted the vote in 2014, he won. He won by like a handful of votes. This is in New York City. This is this is not this is not in our little area where you get you know 
uh, you know, 500 people to vote. This is New York City. A guy won by a handful of votes, and they found he had 30, they, they found, actually proved, 32, he won by like seven votes. They found 32 fraudulent absentee ballots. It changed the, the election. And I said to my colleagues, I said, I realize that many of our colleagues here in Albany have left Albany as criminals, but this guy actually was going to come to Albany because he was a criminal. Mm. <laughs> wow. yeah. But again, election fraud doesn't exist, folks. It's just a myth. <laughs> Look at the for 2,000 mules. It's not a conspiracy theory thing. Look at how they did the forensics yeah. in that, how they tracked down yeah. with cell phone data. Yeah. Everybody that they investigated in there and all the people they found out, the mules, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where it comes yeah. From. If you look at that, it, I don't even see how you could dispute that. Yeah. Right. Well, the bottom line is, is that too many states like New York allow ballot harvesting. They allow, people, they allow the Board of Elections to lose custody of the ballot. Legally. Yes. And that's the problem. Yeah. And hundreds at a time. Yes. Yes. Well, beyond that, though, there's the issue of the voting machines themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how many people have watched the Dominion voting mm -hmm. um, yeah. a video by Patrick Byrne. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm wondering if you could address that. Because, and what can we do about it? Well, you know, look, the, 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 I think the bottom line is you're, you're, we're smarter now than we were a few years ago. We were not, we weren't playing by their rules, okay? And look at I. Well, I think one of the things that I did not like uh, in the 2020 election, especially, was President Trump said, "Be a patriot and go on election day." It sounds like a great idea, and I vote on election day because I think that. Uh, but I, you know, in the in the primary, just in June, I was going to be out of town, so I went to early voting. Uh, but my point is, is that we weren't fighting the same fight they were fighting. They were fighting dirty. Yeah. Okay. They were they were busing people to the polls. They were they were ballot harvesting. They were doing all these things, and we were saying we're going to be patriots and vote only on election day. I'm sorry, folks. We can't do that. If we're going to push back against what they're doing, we got to fight the same fight they're fighting. So we got to do this. We've got to do whatever's legal. We got to do whatever's legal. <laughs> and if and, and no, now vote twice. What's the joke? When I die, don't let me vote Democrat. Uh, so, <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. So, George, um, one of the things that's brought to my attention a lot by various persons is that the Democrats in the state are obviously voting for and putting through legislation that's unconstitutional. Yes. Where is the checksum in the deliberative body that says? This obviously is unconstitutional. Yeah. It shall not go forth. Well, no, that's, see, that doesn't work that way. The only way it works is that you have to bring a court challenge. That's what we, I mean, this is the third time I've sued the governor. Third time's a charm, apparently. Uh, you have to, that's the thing. There is no deliberative body that automatically judges the legislation. And the Democrats know that. They know that. They pass things, and because, again, one party rule. I don't care what your party affiliation is, you have no party affiliation, you should not want one party controlling every lever of government, which is what happens in New York State. And it's happening in, in Washington right now, right? And this is why you know, they, they're in this echo chamber of all, their own, of all their own ideas. So to answer your question, the only way you can do it is you have to step up and you've got to uh, challenge it in court. And of course it's expensive, of course it takes time, and of course the, you know, the odds are stacked against us in so many places. But we can win and we do win. And we've won, you know, again, gerrymandered districts got thrown out in a, in a state that's entirely run by Democrats and every judge was a Democrat. But even they saw how egregious the gerrymandering was. Well, Same thing with the, yeah. You know that like Ben Wasser was the first person to be convicted. Yes, yeah, I know Ben. Safe Act, right? Yep. Now, he, in the end, through a set of appeals, he was exonerated. Yes, eventually. took a long time. The trouble is, it ruined his family financially. I know. I know Ben. Ben Ben's Ben and I know ben, I know Ben well. I mean, they're uh, I know Ben and his wife. And it's, it's tragic. It, it, it's it's it, sh it should not happen. But you know, again, we if there's one thing we have in New York State, it's too many lawyers. But uh, so and they write they write a lot of this legislation that makes it very easy uh, for these things to pass. But anyway, I'm sorry, ma'am, you were had your hand raised. Um, you talked about pushback. Yeah. I read the New York State Education Department's culturally uh, uh, responsive sustaining education, and I wrote a response to that. I sent it to every region. I sent it to the commissioner. I sent it to America First Legal. I sent it to you, and I sent it to Andy Goodell. I've never heard from anyone. 
Well, I haven't seen it. Pushback will be because this is pure evil. Yeah, I know. I know exactly what you're talking about. As a matter of fact, uh, um, the, that particular, uh, I saw a copy of it. Also, what they're trying to teach. Again, it's indoctrination. Uh, you know, it's based it, on conversations with Buffalo Public Schools. Yeah. Buffalo Public Schools. In seven years of data, they had. In grades three through eight, oh, across those seven years, 82% failed the math, the reading. 83% failed the math. Yeah, anything based on uh, how the success level at the Buffalo Public School System is not a good, not a good idea. Yeah. No, trust me. What? Well, well uh, you know, in. Yeah. Not, not yeah. research, not data. Well, and, and I and I apologize if you didn't hear back from it. That's unusual, honestly, for I my team. But yeah. <laughs> well, Randy from my office is here. Um, I'm sorry, your name again. Deanne Nelson. And you sent all right, Deanne, you, and you sent a letter to my office on this particular. I, I know what you're talking about. I've read it. Uh, not your letter, but I read the, uh, the, the this whole course, uh, this new curriculum that they're trying to push. So we'll uh, we will look into that for sure. Okay, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yes. But can you address more specifically the voting machines themselves? Because if the voting machines are rigged, and that's my impression, what are we as citizens supposed to do about that? Yeah, and I can't, I can't say whether or not the voting machines are rigged. I can tell you that, you know, in, in Chautauqua County, you know, I do have a lot of faith in our Board of Elections, and they do have, uh, they do a good job, number one. Uh, number two, the, you know, the, I know these machines, and I've seen the videos, I know what you're talking about. Um, so, all I would say to you is that if there is anything going on there, we just have to we have to be diligent. We have to be, we have to we have to know uh, how many people showed up that day, how many people voted, and what the results were. And you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. We're at the we're at the shame on me stage right now. We have to be united in ensuring that. I don't I don't I don't know enough about the machines to tell you whether or not. Uh, they're, they're rigged. Yeah. 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 What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yes, you know what, yes. I mean, we, how much are these expensive electronic voting machines? Yeah, the old, I mean, the old-fashioned ones with the mechanical, yeah, yeah. Township Yeah. Paper ballots, and how many people vote in a township? In French Creek, I think maybe 200 on a good city yeah. here? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I voted. does it take a township to count their ballots. Mm -hmm. It's not like we have, what, 50,000 votes that one, that one little tiny group has yeah. to count. Well, you know, and that's one of the things we do in really well in Albany is making sure one size fits all, right? So if they need it in New York City, we need it in, you know, Cayentone. Uh, so that, that is a problem. Yeah. Well, I can't, and I know I realize, I realize yeah, you're it's, not Chautauqua County, but can the county stand up and say no more? You know, the, the, those, again, New York is, is, is so adamant about making sure everybody, you know, is in lockstep. Right. That you can't say, well, here we're going to use paper ballots. That just doesn't, you know, it doesn't fly. But that's why, again, this is why we have to have, the, this is why we need to restore balance in our government. This is why we need to, you know, be, 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 yes. Yes, well, that's, that's another piece of legislation. All right, way in the back, I'm sorry. No, no the, yeah, yes. Wait, what, what, I'm sorry, this gentleman back. He's been waiting. He's, yeah. His hand's gone numb, I'm sure. From, <laughs> sorry. Is that's okay. There a legislative process to do this so that we could do it the process. Yeah, you could, you, could do, you could certainly do a legislative process, but, but again, it's got to get up for a vote, and uh, that's going to be the difficult part. The, 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 the New York State government is, you know, corruption is baked into the cake. Uh, you know, when I was a county legislator, I, and I've said if, if county government ran half as well, if state, if state government ran half as well as county government, New York State would be a lot, of be, lot better place to live. It doesn't matter if you're in the majority or the minority. I mean, in Chautauqua County, there are 15 Republicans and four Democrats in the county legislature. And yet, those four Democrats can introduce legislation. They can, the legislation will be heard in a committee meeting. It'll be brought up. It'll be discussed. It'll be voted on. And even if it fails, they have the right to sign through the legislation to get to the full county legislature. And so even, uh, no matter how much minority you're in, in New York State government, the party, the majority party controls everything. They determine whether or not anything gets onto a, uh, whether it's a committee agenda or, or the full legislature. That's, that's why I say the corruption is baked into the cake in New York State. And that goes back a long way, but it's just, it's not the way representative, transparent government should operate. And that's the problem. It would, it would just, it, it just may, may take, it's gonna take forever it may never get there unless we can restore balance in government. And like I said, even if you're a Democrat, 
you should want to restore balance in government. All right, this gentleman back here. So. A couple things about voting today. I live in Jamestown, the south side. Yeah. Went to Cater Church. A couple guys ahead of me. He gave them a, they asked for your last three letters of your last or first three letters of your last name. Of course, in Jamestown, there's lots of Swedes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He could have got a Republican ballot. And for the uh, special, for the um, primary, but he did say, I'm a Republican. <laughs> Because there's no ID yeah. involved. Yeah, that's it's ridiculous. The fact that we don't have to show ID is absolutely ridiculous. I watched this happen. Of course, it throws the whole process into a turmoil because people are waiting. Yeah. yeah. So he got the right ballot, but he because he was first name, last name, the same, different initial. If he hadn't said no, he could have taken both ballots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, and this is what they said too. We had problems this morning because I went there, I went to Zeldin's. Um, Primary. I was out of there in two or three minutes. Yeah, that in June. We've gone from writing down our signatures, because we don't have to show ID, which yeah. would make the most sense. Yeah. Now we're using electronic ID. They had one iPad type device. Yeah, yeah. Same, same thing where I went and yeah. voted. Yeah. Well, but then by the time I left, there were 15 people behind me. Yeah, now this is the same issue. Causing the, um, you know, people like, why, why am I waiting? So, so, and I can't explain why, but I can tell you this much. We had all these, we had two primaries unexpectedly because of the gerrymandered districts, June 28th and today. Plus, early voting, 10 days of voting, nine days of early voting. And all that happened without a single dollar coming from the state government to help pay for the expense of that. So the, the boards of elections had to do the best they could with what they had. And they didn't have enough people, not to mention the fact it's hard to get poll workers. Yeah, yeah. well we didn't. We voted both the Republican and in the special. You had to go through the process twice. Yes. yes. Which took. See, that's wrong. That should have done it. Because okay. what? Yeah. 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 That's they didn't. That that. Well, again, this is this has never happened before. This has never happened before. So, I'm sure that. But the proper. You should have gotten two ballots at the same time, which is what I get. Yeah. That's that's. Well, that was a mistake. Yes, sir. No, the chairman. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I may be unique in the room because I live under two governors. <sighs> My wife and I are snowbirds. Oh. Half of the year I live under Kathy Hochul. The other half of the year I live under Ron DeSantis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ron DeSantis came on the TV one night and he said, Election Day, we close our polls at 9 o'clock and we have our winner by midnight. Yeah. What the hell are they doing in New York? Yeah, he's right. And he's right. And I sat there as a six month resident of New York and said, I wish I knew. Yeah. No, and, and that, that is, and I know that in Florida they're trying to crack down on that. We want to know that night. Um, you know, and look, there's a lot of places where they just keep counting ballots until they get the result they want. Uh, that, that's, that's probably, yes. I uh, don't want to denigrate uh, Palladino, but it seems to me that you would have been an excellent candidate. And I wondered if you could tell us why you didn't run. It seems you, to be, I've been a oh, for, for Congress? Yes. You know, um, I certainly considered it, um, but you know this was not the year for Republicans to be fighting Republicans. That was really you know, and I and I you know, I'm concerned about the fact of what's happening right now. You know, one of the things that Republicans are, you know, Democrats are really good at circling the wagons, right? You know, they they would support Satan as long as he has a D after his name. They really don't, they don't care. Uh, but yet, as Republicans, we circle the wagons and we shoot inward. That's the problem. Uh, and that's what's going on right now, unfortunately. And, and, and um, so we had all this turmoil. First it was going to be Claudia Tenney, and then it was going to be Chris Jacobs, and then we had nobody. And uh, what I would have had to have done was to circulate petitions with my, my name on it to run for Congress. And um, I said, no. I said, we have a process. There's the Committee to Fill Vacancies. And when Chris Jacobs leaves, the Committee to Fill Vacancies should have decided who the candidate would be. And that's not how it worked. Uh, and all I'll say is because a lot of self-serving politics and politicians mm -hmm. is the reason that that happens. So I'm not happy about it, but I'm happy to be your state senator, and I'm happy to continue to be your state senator. And had I, yes. So. Yeah, I'm wondering with the state senate and the uh, assembly, are there any elections coming up that's going to start changing the makeup this year? Yeah, yeah. So let, let me let me address that. That's a good question. So the question is, you know, are there are there 
elections coming up that are going to change things? The answer is yes. So I spent a lot of time talking to people. I spent a lot of time in other districts. I spent a lot of time supporting Republican candidates in other Senate districts. Um, and I've also spent a lot of time talking to, I'm a, I'm a business owner. I talk to fellow business owners. And I talked to people that uh, are in members of different statewide organizations. And I said, the days of transactional politics are over. The whole idea that, you know, well, you know, if we support them, they won't harm our, our industry. Mm -hmm. And I've gone up and said, no, there is no ransom you can pay. These people, they're terrorists, okay? No matter what you give them, no matter how, much, how big the check is, they're still gonna shoot the hostage, my friend. It doesn't matter. And they're starting to listen. They've stopped supporting these radical Democrats that, you know, in several industries, I'm not going to name the industries, but I'm just going to tell you that there are a lot of big organizations out there that used to write fast and furious checks to the Democratic Party, hoping to God that they would stop harming their industry. And, and I said, look, it, the only way that you're going to stop this is by making it difficult or if not impossible for them to keep their grip on power. It's the only way you can do it, which means you've got to stop writing those checks. And you've got to stop holding those fundraisers for them. And you've got to stop you know, writing these letters saying how wonderful they are. And they're starting to listen finally. Everyone here, I guarantee you, belongs to some kind of a statewide organization. I don't care if it's a gun group. I don't care if you're a real estate agent. If you're, you know, there's every organization, every business, every special interest has some kind of a statewide organization. You should find out who they're writing checks to. You'll be surprised. My, I, I, will, I will name one industry, the real estate industry. I talked to friends of mine that are real estate agents and said, go see who your, national, your statewide organization is writing checks to. It's the people that said, oh, guess what? You don't have to pay your rent anymore. You don't have to pay your mortgage. By the way, we're going to make it illegal for you to foreclose on properties. Those are the people your statewide organization that you pay dues to are writing checks to. Make sure it doesn't happen anymore, folks. Every single one of them. So, because we always say, well, you know, you, we've got you, and what do we do? What do we do? The, the, everybody here knows somebody in another part of the state. Everybody here knows somebody that is part of a statewide organization. Everybody here knows somebody that you could speak to and say, don't let that happen. I mean, we, I have a lot of friends in Erie County. You know, we, we, uh, one of the big issues right now is the whole idea that they want to jam industrial wind turbines into Lake Erie, our source of water. And push you back against that. A lot of my colleagues in Erie County have been silent because they don't want to buck big wind. They don't want to buck all that money that's coming in from the green energy industry. And then we're going to wait and see the results of this rigged study. Yeah, so I've been saying, I actually cut a commercial. Call them. Ask them where they stand on this. Because I guarantee you the vast majority of people in Western New York don't want to see that happen. Don't want to see all those toxins and all those things that are buried at the bottom of the lake stirred up so that you know a foreign corporation that makes wind turbines and a bunch of corrupt politicians can profit. Mm -hmm. I don't want that to happen. I don't want to, I don't want to contaminate my drinking water. I'm 55 years old. I remember when, you, when Lake Erie was considered a dead lake. Yep. Yeah, I, remember. I remember being a kid, it was disgusting. You couldn't swim in that lake. Nope. Look at it now, it's beautiful. Yeah. You want to jeopardize that because of some cockamamie boondoggle green energy project? No. We got to get those guys on record, every single one of them. Because if you're an elected official in Western New York, and you aren't saying no, then you are a sellout. Mm -hmm. uh, you know so. when they're going to schedule um, putting up those windmills? Because we they, that's the whole thing. They're doing everything under, undercover. Nobody knows what's going on. I saw them in the railroad bridges uh, over like Route Oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah. The bases are there, and somebody just today mentioned that they're in Erie now. And I've, I've done the tracking, the maritime site, mm -hmm. and the tracking of the NOAA boat, Thomas Jefferson, mm -hmm. which does the seismology. Mm -hmm. Like two years ago, they were in front of our house. Doing this yes, yeah, yeah. Secret well, yeah, it's a, if they thought such a great idea, they thought some people were be on board with it, they'd be more open about it. They wouldn't be all secretive okay, about exactly. it. The point, is, the point is, that stuff's all been done, and that's millions and millions and millions of dollars worth yes. of time with that boat spent doing that. I watched them do Cleveland in May and June. Yeah. They did Erie in uh, July. And they did in front of our places yep. two years ago. Well, and, and NYSERDA has this study, which is totally rigged, because there's nobody on the, this commission that is anything but in green energy. But um, so I mean, I've got a roll soon here. So yeah, so your office said you got to go. Yeah, I do. <laughs> yes, I'm. Uh, but um, I appreciate uh, the time tonight, and I appreciate being with you all. And let's just keep fighting. So thank you.
Thank you, Mel. Oh, thank you, George. Yeah. And by the way, I was thinking of Governor DeSantis today when Andy brought him up.